so this conversation, um, I will, I will give you these closing thoughts as far as Mitch. Um, I think ultimately if the Knicks could get him at a, a number that they feel okay about, which for me is like basically the maximum contract that they could have him for now, which I know we're about to get into numbers. So if they could get him at the the four for 55, um, you know, I think they'd probably want a team option on the fourth year or some kind of small, you know, smaller guarantee. I think they do it um, as opposed to just being, as opposed to trying to cobble together that position moving forward, whether it's through a, a, a dirt cheap option like Damian Jones or whether they want to go a little bit more expensive with one of the other guys we talked about, because I think they like him. And I think if you like a player in the NBA for as much as we try to make things more complicated than they are, I think if you like a player in the NBA and he's on your team, you're going to try to keep that player. Mm -hmm. And it's just about whether or not you could sign him to a contract that you feel okay about being able to move at some later point in time, if you need to. And I think that deal is a, a deal that the Knicks would feel confident that like, look, if we need to get off that money, we can get off that money. Um, whether it becomes a huge asset, you know, whatever. But I, I also think we don't know what they're, what they're thinking is in terms of how they want to approach this position moving forward. And, um, you know, God knows we've been talking for two years now about opening up possibly time at the center position for, you know, Julius Randall or Obi Toppin or, you know, whatever the case may be like all of this stuff, factors in when you're, when you're talking about it, which is why it is a simple conversation. And it's also not a simple conversation and why like all these, like a Damian Jones as like a scrappy option for you to, to, to play 24 minutes a night and like have Sims take the rest of the time. Like it's, it's not nuts. None of these options are nuts because it, this is, it, it, it's a, it, it has, it's, it's a, it's a subject that has its tentacles in a lot of other things. I'll, I'll say that. Yeah, it really does. Like, I don't think this is a conversation you could cut up so easily and not tell the full story. And it's why we're as far into it as we are. And we still haven't even talked about the numbers because we had to get through our vegetables in order to like get more to the dessert. And that's the thought. Like the Knicks could have made Mitchell Robinson a restricted free agent last year. They didn't. They could have and still can extend him for what Dorian Finney-Smith got four years, $55 million. They haven't. Um, And it brings up two questions. Number one, do they even want to keep Mitchell Robinson? And number two is the reason they haven't re-signed him uh, or at least one of them because they want to be operating as an under the cap team. If there is like a Jalen Brunson type signing where they want to clear up cap space and then they get a player like Brunson and then they go over the cap to re-sign Mitchell Robinson, assuming they hold on to his cap hold. That's kind of where the thought process. Well, I think we can make one more assumption, which is that, as of a certain point in time this season, and I forget when, when this report came out, but I think it was Bagley had it that the two sides, meaning Robinson's camp and the Knicks were at, at one point in time, at least not close in terms of extension discussions, which to me uh, is a, is another way of saying that the Knicks never offered the four for 55, because if they offer the four for 55 and Mitch's camp was like, like then the two sides, it's not that the two sides wouldn't be close. It's that Mitchell Robinson wants to take this thing to unrestricted free agency. Saying that the two sides are not close is code to me, at least. I'm assuming a little bit here, but it's code for like the Knicks have not off put their the full offer on the table. Definitely possible. Yeah. Because the other thing, too, is that the Knicks, if they're still going about the process, like going under the cap, why would they even offer a contract to begin with? Yeah. Like, even if, but if they thought, cap hold. Yeah. but that's thing. If they thought they'd get Mitchell Robinson on a great deal that works for them, then they would live with it and they could work around it and yep. do some other ways. But we're 100%. not at that point, and we will likely go to unrestricted free agency. Um, let's break down twenty nine other teams. We can do it really quickly. So uh, these are teams that are expected to be in the luxury tax. It's the Warriors, the Nets, Clippers, Lakers, Bucks, Seventy Sixers, Suns, Jazz, Mavs, Nuggets they are pretty much restricted to using the taxpayer mid-level exception that starts at around $6.4 million. Which Mitchell Robinson is not going to sign for. He's not. And he shouldn't. And, you know, I know there's a prevailing thought, at least for the Mavs, too. It's like, oh, what if they did a Mitchell Robinson and Jalen Brunson sign and trade? Both are base your compensation candidates. It, you know, it makes it, sense. Well, it doesn't. Um, two reasons. Number one, Brunson's going to make a lot more money than Mitchell Robinson will, which means that 
you're going to have to figure out bridging the gap between matching salaries and all that, which is kind of, it gets very messy. It does. But the second thing, which honestly is probably more important is that remember sign and trade when you acquire a free agent and you sign and trade him to your team that hard caps you. If Mitchell Robinson were under contract already and the Knicks did a sign and trade with Brunson and all that, it wouldn't hard cap the Mavs. But because Mitch is a free agent, that would hard cap them. They already have way too much in terms of salary. And they basically need to cut like 11 or $12 million to avoid hitting the tax apron, which you can't do if you do a sign and trade because it hard caps you. So they are, to me, out barring some sort of crazy move where they like, dump Tim Hardaway Jr. completely and then sign and trade Mitch into a, uh, a traded we're, player exception. We're, and also, we are witnessing how the Mavs want to play. Mm-hmm. They, they know how they want to play. They have Luka fucking Doncic. They're going to play when it, when push comes to shove, they're going to play five out. Okay. Um, so, yeah, it's not, it's not going to happen. And, yeah. and, and, there, and this, sorry, last thing, Robinson to the Mavs was something being pushed by, you know, well, let me just say, there are always reasons why things get out there in terms of like rumors and like, oh, the Mavs are interested. Like there's always an agenda. I do not think that that is a, a credible thing anymore. Let's let's move on. Agreed. So, folks, we've cut an, a third of the league out of the equation. Congratulations to us. Right. Yes. Great job. <laughs> Great. Next, uh, over the cap teams, unlikely to have the full non-tax mid-level exception. Um. It's the Celtics, the Hornets, the Cavs, the Heat, the Pelicans, and the Bulls. Six of them. Celtics, we can rule out because they have Robert Williams. Have the, yeah, Robert Williams. Uh, Cavs, we can Hor- rule out. Right, yep. Heat, yeah. we could rule out. Mm-hmm. Pelicans, we could rule out. Yes. The Bulls are... We could probably rule them out just based on the financial issues. Like They'd yeah. have to... It'd have to be with Vucevic. Moving it would have to out. be a massive shakeup. It'd be something yeah. that I don't think is super possible, but it'd be, it'd be interesting. It's not... It's not, I don't want to say it's impossible. It's just improbable. Yeah. Very improbable. Um, and then it gets to the Hornets, right? Because people think just sign Mitch with the mid-level and uh, it's $10.3 million. Go for it. Which with 5% raises, we should say that yes. the contract ends up being something like four for 45 about. Yeah. Something along those lines. Okay. Um, the interesting thing with the Hornets is this, again, if they do the full mid-level exception, it hard caps them. They have to deal with the Miles Bridges contract. And they're also trying to get most likely off of the Gordon Hayward, Gordon Hayward deal. contract. Yeah. And then like they're they're they could do it. It's just they're similar to the Bulls. They're all these moving pieces where you're worrying about the tax apron, but Michael Jordan's more worried about the luxury tax period, where he's not going to go into the luxury tax for this. And it's why I think the that the Hornets are maybe more likely to be a like veteran minimum type player, or they sign someone for cheaper. Like maybe they go after a player like Damian Jones. Maybe they do Andre Drummond. I, I don't really know exactly what it is, but they might find that the talent they have on the roster and the finances that they're dealing with right now are more important than going out and getting Mitchell Robinson. And um, with a new coach, it might be a different philosophy. Like again, if, if D'Antoni is going to be coaching there, it does he want Mitchell Robinson? Is that the type of player who would fit? I know that we saw with Capella and, and MDA, but like, I don't know if Mitch is necessarily the guy, but I don't want to rule them out completely because again, no. you could see it as, as a, an affordable option. But then if you're like, if you are Charlotte and you see Rashawn Holmes available, do you say, Oh yeah, well the Kings need wings. Let's give him Kelly Oubre Jr. He could be a, a scorer off or, the bench for them. Or even Book Knight, who didn't, right. who, who set like records by how little he played this year for a yeah. top 10 pick. Or I was thinking more, was more of the money involved because he's making so. But, but yes, yeah. exactly. Like there are things that they could do where they feel like a good. Don't they have another. Uh, don't they have another middling set? Oh, I mean, they could, they could trade uh, Kai Jones. Plumlee. And, well, yeah, Plumley yeah. as well. Yeah, Kai Jones isn't quite ready, but he's getting there. And I think JT Thor is another guy they have. But yeah, sure. So, but again, if we rule out the Hornets, then that's 16 teams, 17, including the Knicks, because they're not yes. a, a threat we'll to acquiring him. <laughs> um, then you have the over the cap teams that are likely. Oh, did I? 
What? No, no, I'm, we're good. We're good. I did this fine. Uh, over the cap team is likely to have the non taxpayer mid level exception. So they and actually have, uh, yeah, have, have, it and have access to the full thing. Right. And we could knock a bunch of these teams off right away. Yes. So it's the Hawks, the Rockets, the Timberwolves, the Thunder, the Kings, the Raptors, and the Wizards. The Hawks, easy, gone. The Rockets, I don't see why they're investing money in Mitch when they have their own center products. Timberwolves, the cat again. Cat, no. The Thunder, not trying to win games, do, but right, that doesn't seem the most uh, likely. The Kings, who no. we've talked about, their set. The Raptors are an interesting. Raptors are interesting bunch. Um, they I don't. Can I tell it, you? But I don't see it. Not with how they play. Not with, with the, the versus facing the fives a little bit more. Not with, well with the versatility that they want on defense. Yeah, and. I still think Raptors DNA is I know Kawhi is not there anymore. And like, it's a very different team from, from the team that won the championship, but man, I feel like I've never seen a team defend on a string like that Raptors team did when they were really firing on all cylinders. And this team, I feel like it's part of why they drafted Scotty Barnes. You could, again, one of the few guys in the league that truly, truly can defend all five positions. Um, Mitch is, that's not Mitch. And yeah. you're, you're, you know, you, so I, Maybe look, maybe and look I at, don't see it. Look at who their fives have been. Uh, Valanchunas, Gasol, Ibaka, Boucher, all stretch fives. Tim Birch. Like these are guys who, who stretch the floor a bit. That's not yep. who Mitchell Robinson is. Yep. Um, and then the wizards who like Porzingis Gafford, unless they're trading one of those guys and they don't want to start the other for whatever reason, it doesn't compute why they would want Mitchell Robinson. I don't really see it. No. So then we're left with six teams that could the be six under teams the cap, with cap space or their wildcard teams. They could become yeah. that. So the Orlando magic, the, no. I, I don't see it. The Pistons, they were certainly linked to the Knicks or to Mitchell Robinson. We'll it, save them for less. And so the sure. ones that are linked. Yeah. Sure. The Pacers, if they keep miles Turner, I don't really see it unless they, and they also just four, but they why? just drafted, uh, they Isaiah just drafted as a Jackson. Yeah. Yep. Uh, the Blazers, I, uh, they're one of those teams where they could go either way over the cap, under the cap. I just don't necessarily see why they would it, go with Mitch. I think they're fine with Nurkic, but and maybe they're not. I was doing digging on the Blazers this week because I wrote about him for Friday. And one, uh, and again, GM say a lot of shit, but their new, newly named permanent general manager, Joe Cronin, referred to use of Nurkic as something like he's a big part of what we do. He's a core piece. He basically talked about him as a guy that we want to have back. Also, yes, the Blazers could get way under the cap, but the more I looked at it, unless they, the only reason they're, let me rephrase that. The only reason they're getting under the cap is if they're signing Zach Levine or someone of that ilk. And it's not so they can go out and spend big money on Mitchell Robinson. Right. If they, it makes a lot more sense because of the trade exception that you've spoken about, in Jeremy Grant context. And for a variety of other reasons, it makes a lot more sense for them to operate as an over the cap team. Mm -hmm. um, they could, of course, uh, do a sign and trade, or rather, the Knicks could sign and trade Mitch into the that exception. Although, it, do we really think that that's how the Blazers are going to be using? The, like, they're probably bringing back Nurkic. So, like, yeah, yeah let's can we just cross them off. Yeah, and I, I think there's going to be one prevailing thought from fans. If I think I know Knicks fans like I do, what it's going to be? Oh, well, what about? Um, Simons for Mitchell Robinson. It's, no, it's not going to happen. No. We, we can just put it to bed right now. It's not going to happen. Uh, the Spurs have Pirtle. He's been a guy that's been discussed as like, is, might he be available to other teams mm -hmm. um, who are looking for a center? Uh, does that mean that they want to go spend money on Mitch? I, I, I don't know. Would it shock you? Yeah, that's it, one that it wouldn't, would. it, it, really, it wouldn't shock me. It would because I feel like there's such a clear cut need for the Spurs for a, f a four. Um, yeah. But they're also in such an interesting position because That's, they have more picks than they know what to do with. They also have a ton of roster spots being taken up. So they need to consolidate as well. I just, I feel like when they do that, Mitch probably isn't the guy who winds up in San Antonio. <gasps> like they'd have to move Pirtle because Mitch would only be taking money to be a backup five. And I think he'd rather have more, responsibility yeah. and playing time and get paid. And like, so the reason I, I say I wouldn't be shocked is like, we saw them make a, a talent 
an attempt at a talent grab when they signed. Um, oh my God, the kid who was in Portland who who like hasn't played basketball very much over Zach the last Collins. So, Zach Collins, like talented guy, right? Talented guy. They signed him to a really team friendly contract. Hurdle they extended him in a really team friendly contract. That's the thing though, is like, are they really going to trade Pirtle just so they could pay Mitch? what, $5 million more next year than Pirtle is, is on the books for to be, and I, I hate to say this, but like Mitch is not as good of a, a center as Pirtle, all things considered, especially how the, the Spurs use Pirtle. Like they, they, they have him do some different things. So yeah, fine. Cross them off. And the Grizzlies we can cross off because they have um, Stephen Adams and Jaron Jackson Jr. And that's just not how they fully operate. It's, it, yeah, it's not how they do business. So we're left with one team. The Detroit again, Pistons. These are all subject to change, but this really feels like the most likely threat. Uh, and I should mention one thing if you're listening and not watching the room exception for these teams, assuming they're under the cap is uh, $5.3 million, which Mitch isn't signing for that. It, yeah. So no, the, these teams would have to use cap space to, or the uh, trade a player exception. Yeah. Or but, the trade a player exception. Yes. Yes. But the Pistons are just so fascinating because listen, do I think that they would basically kick Marvin Bagley to the curb if they wanted to sign Mitch Robinson. Sure, they have the they, ability to do it. They traded two seconds for Bagley. They could just view it as like, well, technically we traded two seconds to then sign Mitchell Robinson, so uh, that's fine. They have the money. They've got like north of $20 million to spend. It's um, They also have a lot of centers, though, or at least they have a lot of bigs. So they have Isaiah Stewart. You mentioned mm-hmm. Marvin Bagley, who we should say played uh, at least by cleaning the glass estimates. And then I went and actually th- looked at the lineups. And I think these are actually accurate. Played about 40% of his time at, at the four. Um, does that mean it's a good idea to play Marvin Bagley at the four? Does that mean they want to do that moving forward? Uh, they were already out of it, obviously, after they traded for Bagley. So I wouldn't probably read too much into that. They have Bagley and they have Kelly Olynyk still mm-hmm. for, I believe, another Two seasons, right? Yeah, I think one of them might be non. Oh, yeah, I'm sure like one that. of them is, is not guaranteed. But yeah, that it's and they have not that I think he's going to make a lot of moves, but they have Luca Garza. Oh so yeah, they, they do have Garza. Have, I forgot about Garza. Prioritize him in some way, and then and they also they wind go- up with a top three, four pick. They could there you go walk away with another front court player. And and you want to talk about a team that is well, I was going to say they're probably not a, a Jaden Ivy. Destination. Then again, Ivy next to Kate actually probably would make a lot I of sense. Oh, whatever. Good. Yeah. Yeah, he could. So maybe maybe I misspoke there. Um, the point is they do have centers. The thing that I find so fascinating about the Detroit situation and why I wrote earlier this week or last week in the Knicks Film School newsletter that I think that they are the team that could have the biggest impact on New York's offseason is because they are also a team that has been rumored for one, Jalen Brunson, who will be coming to a cap or no cap near you soon. Um it, this stuff ties together because if they go and they spend the money it takes to go sign Jalen Brunson, um, they're not going to have enough money. I mean, they, they could, they could have enough money left for Mitch. It would require, a, I think a little cap creativity, but it would leave them in a bit of a tight spot. It, Marvin Bagley probably goes bye-bye. Um, do, again, do they want to do that? We don't know. It, it, it'll be interesting. Yeah. Especially because, and I know we'll probably touch base on this in a minute, but Obviously, one of the concerns for Knicks fans, and rightfully so, is, well, what happens if Mitchell Robinson just walks to the Pistons? That would be bad. Losing Mitch for nothing would not be good asset management. No. And they were one of the, I believe, four teams who were rumored to be interested in Mitch at the deadline, and the Knicks stood pat. And I think in that case, if you're the Knicks, if Mitch is gone and he's going to Detroit and there's nothing you could do about it, then you basically say to the Pistons, well, at least let us sign and trade him into your cap space so we can get a traded player exception. So we do get something. Um, But the Pistons would say, sure, but it's going to cost you a second round pick. Exactly. Because that's exactly what the Knicks did with Evan Fournier. It's why he took as long or part of the reason why it took as long to finalize the deal to get him on board. Um, Basically the Celtics sent two second round picks, one, which was fake and didn't really convert. And the Knicks sent cash like $110,000 and they worked it out. And the Celtics were able to create this very large traded player exception that I think they still have because they took Derek white with the Josh Richardson one and whatnot. But anyways, like it was still an asset that they created. Now it's on the Celtics to use that. Otherwise they would have essentially paid a second round pick 
or cash and that's it. And the Knicks would then want to use that to take on more salary, thus making them more likely to be above the cap following season. But that's the thing. I understand their fans would be like, you're telling me that the best you got from Mitchell Robinson was a traded player exception when you could have acquired or you could have traded him at the deadline. And it goes back to the prevailing thought. We have nothing, absolutely nothing of known knowledge to operate on for what was being offered at the time. And I think I, that's the, the biggest key where it's like, and I, I know we might see still a little differently. No, this, I, but, I, I don't see we that just, We just have no idea. Like if you're telling me that, the Pistons had the best offer, right? And it was those two second round picks that they gave for Bagley. Fans would be furious. Fans would be yeah. like, you know, he's, he's worth way more than that and all this. So I know that if Mitch gets signed and traded, that there's going to be this conversation of the Knicks should have dealt him. We don't know what he was worth. He's, a, he's an unrestricted free agent with question marks that we still don't really have answers to. And it's, it's just not the easiest situation to take on. So I, just something to consider for those out there. If the situation presents itself, a couple things, uh, Mitch is, I don't know what he's getting signed for. He's not getting signed for enough that you would create a traded player exception big enough to sign, uh, Jalen Brunson. So for anybody out there thinking that, um, I, maybe there's another obstacle to doing that. Although I think probably could, if I guess if Brunson was willing to wait to sign, um, that's one thing Two. I agree with you. If it was Mitch for two seconds, no, you don't do it. If it was Mitch for two seconds on Isaiah Stewart, I'd at least have a meeting about it. Um, I probably, honestly, I might have, I might have walked away from that. I think I probably would have walked away from that because, like Stewart profiles to me, as I was, I'm digging into him a little bit. He looked profiles as like a really nice backup big, like mm-hmm. a great energy guy, come off the bench, play 15, 20 minutes. You're getting that in two seconds for Mitch when you can maybe bring him back at a nice number, which is, I know this is what this is all getting at, which is the Knicks are probably going to be able to get him at a nice number for all of the reasons that we're going through. Um, and then the last thing is like, maybe the Pistons are not as big a threat as we have been potentially led to believe. And I will just leave it at that. I think that's fair. So we're almost done, but a few talking points. Uh, first, I'm sure there's some people wondering, like, how can you not be in favor of paying Mitch and retaining him, but you're totally cool with paying RJ a lot of money and their questions there. Honestly, it's, it's personal preference with, with fit. And by fit, I don't mean like how the players fit. I mean, like I am someone who thinks more heavier usage wings are worth more than rim running centers. And I think that the pay disparity matches that. It's not about like, you shouldn't pay Mitch, so just let him walk. You can pay him, but there's a certain price point at which maybe you shouldn't. Maybe you can find other ways to to do other things. Um, And I think it's also, it's hard to see what the end goal can be here. But if you were to create Mitch into a traded player exception, and then you take a player into that TPE, and then you use that player to then flip it for a better player than it, would it have been worth it? Sure. hundred percent would have, but that's, that's the question of how you get from one place to the next. But for me, it's, I know realistically RJ is not going to get a max, um, but there's a difference in terms of the, the players and the responsibilities. And that's an important piece of it. Yeah. Um, I, I want him back all things being equal. Um, I, at this point, if I was betting on it, I, I would probably, I've, and I've wavered on this. I've waffled. <laughs> I would probably bet that he would be back uh, if I was to bet on it right now because of the market. Um, but it has to be at the right number. I think it wind up, it will wind up being at the right number. I bet you he doesn't get four fully guaranteed years. I bet you it's three fully guaranteed years from whether it's the Knicks or somebody else. And I bet the fourth year has maybe a small guarantee or is not, or is just a team option. Um, And then just the last thing I'll say is just like, look around at the teams that are still playing. Um, Boston Celtics missing their starting center seem to be doing okay. Uh, The Bucks are still using Brooke Lopez here and there, but for all intents and purposes, Giannis is their center now. Um, The Miami Heat, Bam Adebayo, 
different conversation. He is the one guy who there's a reason why he's a max player and he is not a otherworldly offensive force because he does enough special things at both ends that he makes it worth it. And he is a linchpin to everything that they do on the defensive end of the court. And it's why he, he uh, finished whatever he finished in defensive player of the year voting. Um, Warriors, Kevin Looney, thanks for your regular season contributions. We'll, we'll see you next season. Uh, you know, not a major part of what they do at this point either. Great game uh, six though. Yeah, Crucial. he did have a big game six, but otherwise, uh, yeah, we, we've seen Steven Adams be left on the sidelines. Uh, they're reincorporating him. They reincorporated him towards the end of that series as job went out because they didn't really have a choice. And uh, who am I forgetting? Uh, the Suns with, with again, with DeAndre Aiden, who again is, is going to be a fascinating test case this summer in terms of whether they, they pay him um, for what he, you know, may offer as a difference maker. Um, you, th- this is, this is not the position you break the bank for in the NBA. Um, and unless they're elite, unless and they're elite, then- it, unless they are truly elite at something or multiple somethings, right. uh, that's not Mitchell Robinson. Yes. He's an elite offensive rebounder, but that is not, that's not enough. Uh, you know? Uh, so yeah, I I'll, guess we'll see what happens. Yeah. And just uh, a few more quick points. Maybe yeah. Mitch wants more responsibility. If that's something that the Knicks aren't willing to do on, you know, from a schematic standpoint, then he has the power to leave. Maybe money is not the most important thing to him because he feels like he can get solid money elsewhere. It's comparative. He wants to be happy. Maybe it's not here. I don't really know. Um, we talked about the sign and trade possibilities and how that can work into play base your compensation, of course, being a factor, but it doesn't just have to be trading or sign and trading for, um, you know, into another team's cap space. It could be for another player in return. We don't have the details on the deadline, so we'll see how that goes. But the last thing is really unlikely bonuses. The Knicks could offer, really any team probably could offer up to 15% per year of unlikely bonuses. And, you know, you mentioned the Robert Williams contract. I think that is probably the market to set. If Robert Williams hit the market right now, I think he'd make more. Even with the playoffs and his knee injury, I I think he still could stand and make more, but he made the right decision and just took the money. And and that was great for him. So what did Robert Williams get? He got four years, 48 million with $6 million in unlikely bonuses. I feel like if you're the Knicks and you're Mitchell Robinson and you want to come to an agreement four for 45, four for 46, um, sounds nice. Makes, make the team option on the last year, have some, um, have, Four, five, six million dollars. Let's say, let's say six million dollars there too, or five million dollars. Let's go five million dollars for uh, for unlikely bonuses. Mitch walks away with like what? Four years, fifty million dollars, fifty-one million, maybe thirty-two of it's guaranteed, something along those lines for over three years, thirty-four million dollars, whatever it is. He's going to make a lot of money. It's pretty great. I think that's a nice happy medium point and the Knicks can do all the things they want to do still keep his cap hold and then, you know, do whatever they need to. If it's sign and trading Mitch, if it's retaining Mitch, whatever, but he's a good player. I hope the Knicks can retain him. Just there's a certain point where you don't break the bank. I have nothing else to add. That was well said. Uh, I agree with you. I think that's where this is going to wind up, you know? And um, if it doesn't, it means something Something probably a little strange has happened. We can just leave it at that for now since we don't know what might happen. All right. Um, Andrew. John. How are you doing? Good. You know, it would have been hilarious if what? during this this marathon about Mitchell Robinson, he extended. That would have been. <laughs> That's not the first time that I've had a Lonzo, prevailing uh, thought. Lonzo Ball, you pulled up the thing and then the Knicks nope. signed Austin Rivers when you were done 10 minutes in. Or or you also Mike you Conley, else? Didn't Mike Conley happen where I had this like thought process and then it was like, oh, never mind. Well, I'll just get through it anyway. It might have been. Yeah. The actual point I remember you were in the middle of was like they're going to sign like they could sign Lonzo to this and that. And then they could like you might have had another guard in there. And the Knicks had an opening at guard. And then all mm-hmm. of a sudden. Woj reports Knicks have signed Austin Rivers, rendering everything you just said for the last 20 minutes, you know, irrelevant. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So really quick producer's corner. Um, yes. because not only 
is the NBA offseason going on for us. But uh, a couple of game sevens in the playoffs are going on today. Uh, both results will have happened by the time everybody hears this. So I thought I'd take a trip down memory lane for Knicks fans and the history of the Knicks in game sevens. Uh, Jeremy, I'm going to be very impressed if you can name as many as there have been. But I'll just say there's there's there have been 15. OK, do you over under how many game sevens have the Knicks won? Let, let's let's guess with with Jeremy. Well, aren't they? They've played several of them at home, though. They haven't played a home game at game seven since 94. Correct. And I know. Uh, I, no, nine, 95. They played a game seven. 95. Okay. Yes. 95. The, you got, and the so finger roll. Right, right, right. Of course. So you're asking me how many they've won? At, at how the many game or, seven? No, just in general. How many they've played many game, sevens, game sevens ever? How, how have they won? Uh, eight of them. I'll John. go seven. It, they're seven and eight. So you okay. guys are close. Yeah. Um, so, John, go back in time. How many? When's the last time they played a game seven? The last time the Knicks played a game seven. Jeremy knows. I do. Was against the Heat in 2000. Correct. Conference semis. They won 4-3, game seven in Miami. Uh, one of the most satisfying game sevens of the list that you're about to see, at least for me um, and my hatred and rivalry against my personal hatred because I'm on the team, um, hatred <laughs> against the Miami Heat. Um, I mean, I'm doing game sevens, not game fives, because there are some game five wins yeah. against the Heats that were pretty satisfying as well. Um then there's another one against the Heat in 97 that Which they you, lost. You don't talk about that one. <laughs> nine men, one mission. The fight in game five leads to Ewing gets getting suspended. Uh, game six, they lose at home, even though they're up three one in the series. They lose in seven games in Miami. 95, the one Jeremy, uh, I guess not forgot, but I guess didn't. And it's the last time they've they've had a game seven at home. Um, and it's the Patrick Ewing finger roll and the. Go and ahead. the year before that, I remember distinctly because they played one fewer game than was possible in the playoffs when they only went to four games against the Nets in the first round instead of mm -hmm. all five. But they went seven games against the Bulls, Pacers, and Rockets, winning, yes. of course, two of them. Three consecutive game sevens um, in, in the second, third, and fourth round. Uh, 1992, the Chicago Bulls, they took to game seven. Mm -hmm. um, one of the better Bulls teams of the Jordan era. Lost game seven by a lot, but put a lot of teams on notice that this Knicks team could be on the rise. And then next year in 93, Charles Smith and the rest of us all know it happened. Although if you ask John Starks, the series ended after game two and we're putting posters up of how game two ended everywhere. Um, then we go back to when guys before that. Um, we've named seven of them so far, by the way. And there's, so that means there's eight left. Yes. Math. Uh, math. There you go. Uh, I don't think they played any against the Pistons. No, there Maybe. are two game fives against the Pistons yeah. though, that were, that were pretty good. 92 game five. Um, game Ewing, five against the Celtics. Ewing is there a Bernard eight. King game seven? No. Yeah. Yes. John. There was, there was a Bernard King against Larry Bird. Game oh my God. Seven yeah. So it, the year the, after he beat the Pistons in five games, he went to game seven against the Celtics and lost. Yes. That's right. Bird had 39 in game seven. Unfortunately for that series, the Knicks won three very close games at home and lost four not close games in Boston. Yes. In that series, uh, both Bernard King and Larry Bird averaged 30 in the series, which, you know, the you had Parrish and Mikhail and the rest of the Celtics showing that it takes a team, not just a superstar to uh, win a championship. Bef before that, do you have to go to uh, 70? They made it to the conference. Um, I think they made it to the conference finals in 74, didn't they? 74, they made it to the semis and they beat who? Because they lost in the, they, okay, yeah, you're right. They made it to the conference finals and the conference yeah. semis is a game seven. They in beat which the, they beat who? No, they didn't beat the Celtics, did they? The Celtics are the team they lost to. They lost the to in the conference. Finals. In the conference finals, conference finals. I forget who they beat. Uh, 
the first year of a name change, the Capital Bullets. Oh yeah, is who they beat. In fact, John probably knows this. I don't know if you know this, Jeremy, um, but maybe Knicks fans don't know this. The Knicks played the Bullets six straight yeah. years from '69 to '74 in the playoffs, um, and most of the series went the distance, like 1973. Um, when the Knicks played the oh 1973, they played they played the Bullets, but that didn't go the distance. Um, in the '73 Conference Finals, so they played the Celtics yep. and won in seven games. These are the post Bill Russell Celtics. Clyde had um 25, 10, and seven in Game Seven. I should mention the Capital Bullets from '74. Uh, Earl of Pearl Monroe had 30 in Game Seven to lead all scores and give the Knicks the win. Uh, 1971, they also beat the Baltimore Bullets. Uh, this series went seven games. Excuse me, 1971, they lost in the conference finals to the Baltimore Bullets, leading to a Bullets Bucks finals in, in which, which Kareem whitewashed. Uh, yeah. yeah was not as good. a rookie or as a second year? His rookie year was 1969 70. So, so this player. is his second year. Yeah. Um, 1970, back to back game sevens in the conference semis. They beat Baltimore. And then the finals, they beat the Lakers. A, every Knicks fan that exists should know how the. Game seven against the Lakers went. Um, and the, the the previous year is when they lost in seven to the Celtics in the conference semis, right? That is correct. No, the, sorry, the conference, conference then, finals. Excuse me. Let me double check that. I don't think they lost in seven, but I will double check. Oh, maybe that. not. Okay. I know they lost the Celtics in, in 69. Um, I Maybe it didn't go seven games. Okay. Um, and then we go, I'll just give you these. The two in 1952 and 51, um, they lost to the Minneapolis Lakers in the finals and the Rochester Royals in the finals. Back then, the, only the finals went best of seven because there were eight teams. Yeah. Doing the doing the research for this, the most depressing part of this. So we joke about how Bill Russell dominated an era of basketball where eight teams existed. Um, six of them made the playoffs. So it was like this weird thing where you could be in third place with an under 500 record and you're a playoff team. Um, the Knicks from like 1959 to 1967 didn't make the playoffs. They were a lot. They were the last place team every single year yeah. and looking for this. Like, Oh, didn't make the playoffs. Didn't make. The, oh, wow. This is depressing. So, so yeah, yeah it was, it was not great. <laughs> they are six and one, excuse me, five and one in game fives, by the way, the only, the only game five they've lost is the last one to ever Toronto be available. The Toronto game. Exactly. Yep. So. Oh, yeah, that was the last one. That was before they changed. Okay. Yes, they went to guess of seven the next year, much to Doc Rivers' dismay because in the first round, he blew a 3-1 lead to the Detroit Pistons. Good poor I'm guy. Glad, I'm glad we got that in there. Yes. <laughs> all right. That was good producer's corner. Thank After you. Look back. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right. And on that note, um, anything? I think that's it. Uh, we are still working out the details. We will do something on Tuesday for the lottery. Though. Oh, yes, yeah, so we will. Letting everybody know. We have like the, the rough draft and the outline of a plan. Um, exactly what the plan is will get announced sometime later today when you're listening to this on Monday or at, at worst Tuesday morning. But I think we could iron out details by Tuesday, by, by Monday around noon. I am excited for that. I hope there is a reason for like, like a, a payoff to set excitement, you know, yeah, we'll see. We'll find out soon enough. Um, okay. Jeremy, uh, tour de force as always. Thank you. Well done, sir. Thank uh, you for joining me. Andrew, uh, <laughs> of course, uh, Andrew, thank you as always. Uh, you, you and know where, just, to, you know where to find me. I exactly, I do. <laughs> uh, and I'll just end by saying something that I have absolutely nothing else knowledge about what I'm about to say, but I will say, but end by saying go Rangers. Yeah. Go right. Ra- oh, wow. I really hope that has payoff because by I the was, time. Yeah. This I air- was not going to even say anything because the last time we recorded uh-huh. it did not go well for the Rangers, um, but the cat's out of the bag. So listen, um, as somebody who was supposed to go to game seven until like 12 hours ago. Um, I also echo go Rangers from the comfort and safety of my couch tonight. So, uh, and on that note, we of course thank all of you, our listeners. Thank you for checking out another edition of the Knicks film school podcast. Uh, we'll be back with you with, uh, more fun and games very soon.